This is Zach Petrock, and welcome to part one of the form of anatomy. In this lecture, we'll be covering the origin and insertion and rhythms of all the main muscle groups of the body. So we're going to be reviewing the figure in groupings of muscles, so the torso, the arms, and then the legs. But what I'd like to do is start with going over some of the global gestures in the skeleton. So in front view, you can see that he has a pretty wide stance. And I've set this character up in somewhat of a heroic pose. You can also see as we move into side view here, the chest is the furthest point forward. So that means this character leads with his chest, which is very typical of your archetypal hero pose. And what that also allows us to do is pull the head back as well as the legs. So at least towards the bottom here, uh, the ankle is further back. And what that does is kind of counterbalance or offset the chest being thrown so far forward. And by pulling the head back, we're going to get a much straighter line at the back of the neck. So where the trapezius muscle is going to uh, insert, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Uh, but by having that stronger line, it just gives a different read to the character. And I think it's more in line with what we're after for this guy. So looking at a few other things, you can see that essentially none of these lines are straight. So none of the bones are just uh, in their default straight pose, or what would be a T pose for animation. I wanted to give this guy a lot of character and gesture so you could really see how those things play off, even from the skeleton, uh, to affect the muscles and the overall pose. So you can see here the arm, for example. It's always uh, counterbalancing, so front to back, front to back, and then even in back view here you have those balances where a lot of directional change is going to happen. And you can see that's also carrying all the way down through the legs as well. So all these things play into the gesture and we'll be talking more about that as we get into the specific groupings of muscles in the body. So as we cover the torso, arms and legs, we'll come back to those points as well. And before we get started with the muscles, I wanted to give a quick example of a reading silhouette. So here you'll see I've made a very basic form, and this could be any muscle grouping on the body, so a bicep or quadricep, uh, but you'll see that the form itself is creating the silhouette. So fairly straightforward and a pretty simple thing to understand. But you'll notice as I start to rotate around to the side, if we have another form intersecting, so this would be a secondary muscle group, uh, obviously as we rotate the form, then that shape is going to start to affect the silhouette. So when you're trying to translate uh, your understanding of anatomy, particularly from 2D reference, so if you have anatomy books or charts, uh, this can be a really interesting thing to wrap your head around, and I think it's very beneficial uh, if you understand what's actually going on here. But you'll see that as you rotate around the form, right, you're going to see more or less of this secondary shape. So this secondary shape is going to become more predominant or less predominant in the silhouette itself. So that sounds pretty straightforward. But let's go ahead and take a look at the figure and look at an example of that in a little bit more of a complex way. As we come down here to the upper leg, you'll notice that we have the hamstring and quadricep groups here. But really, if I look at this muscle group, the hamstrings from this back view are not making up the entire silhouette of the leg. So what that tells me uh, right here, if I can locate that line of differentiation between those two muscle groups, it's going to tell me uh, how those two are related in space. So which one is out further? So as we rotate around here, you'll notice that all I'm seeing is the quadricep. So the outer edge of that muscle is much further outboard than the outer edge of the hamstring when we come around to the back. So this really can help you understand and read form on a different level. So it sounds like a very simple concept, but it's something we're going to be referring back to quite often. Uh, and I think it'll really help you once you wrap your head around it fully. So let's go ahead and move into the torso now. And we'll start by taking a look at the skeleton. For me, the rib cage and the torso are always the root of my pose and gesture. So I always like to start there. 
and you'll notice here the rib cage is as a global form kind of leaning back and it also has a lot of curvature here in front view and side view so you'll often hear this uh, referred to as an egg shape and that's a fairly accurate description but it's also important to take a look at this form from a lot of different angles and see really how it changes and looking right here you can see it flattens out as it starts to wrap around and come towards the front at the sternum but globally just remember that uh, leaning back of the rib cage and then the overall curvature Let's take a look at the spine here and the curvature caused by the thrusting forward of the rib cage and looking at how it wraps up into the base of the skull almost into the center of the skull depending on your character as well but the global positioning of the head relative to the torso is very important if you push the head further forward it can make your character look a little off balance or older as well so let's go ahead and move into the clavicle I'd like to come into top view here and really take a look at how much this bone curves as it wraps around to the outside here so that's important because a few different muscles are going to use that as an origin and that curvature actually comes into play as well once the deltoid wraps into that area and looking at it from front view you can see you know the curvature in front view varies greatly from uh, model to model but I like to have a little bit of curvature in there just to help set up the flow and the rhythms as it uh, curves out towards the arm have a little bit of curvature down but again starting in there at the sternum and then attaching on the outside there to the scapula. So let's go ahead and take a look at just some of the main forms in the scapula. The spine of the scapula here, and that's important for a few different muscle groups that we'll talk about in a minute. Obviously uh, that's where the humerus is going to insert. And a few other things worth noting here, this little guy called the coronoid process. So that's where the bicep, one head of the bicep is going to attach and as we get into the arm we'll talk about that and that becomes very important for understanding that global shape of the bicep and what we're setting up and up here uh, off of the spine of the scapula as it wraps around and becomes the acromion so you can see here the clavicle coming right up and attaching into that acromion which flows all the way back around and essentially becomes more of the spine of the scapula and if we go back to the rear view again here you can see the spine of the scapula flowing all the way down and then terminating here on the inside edge and this area is important in here it's where you have a lot of different muscles it's a really tricky part for people so we'll come back to that but just make a mental note of that shelf that's created underneath the spine of the scapula and uh, towards the outer borders of it also notice that you know there is some subtle curvature to the scapula as well because it needs to conform to the curvature of the rib cage in all views so let's go ahead and move on to the pelvis there are a lot of form changes in this bone uh, but one of the main ones that we want to take note of is the crest of the pelvic bone here and the uh, point right here at the end a lot of different muscles attaching right here so that's important to note and as we get into some of the upper leg muscles we'll refer back to this and, and see how they're attaching and overlapping but it's also important to follow that spine all the way down here and then look towards the bottom have a lot of the adductor muscles the inner part of the leg it's a difficult area as well right here where the femur is going to insert uh, not necessarily a lot of muscles going on there but important to point out and back here the end of the the back part of the spine of the pelvis here an important landmark as well all right so let's go ahead and take a look at the skull I will be covering this more in depth in part two as I cover some of the facial features but I just wanted to give you a, a global overview here uh, one of the most important things to notice is that the high point on the skull is typically in the back so about three quarters back here that's a common mistake I used to uh, make that mistake a lot it's really hard to read this form because of the way the forehead is actually wrapping back uh, but you can see from front view here that furthest point back is actually really towards the back of the head so that becomes important as well and uh, noticing in the back side view there you can see that the the back of the skull is typically not flat either obviously that varies but you just want to make sure that you're getting a good read on your model and understanding uh, that there is typically a surface change right there in this back area 
Let's go ahead and look at part of the muzzle here. You can see that you know the muzzle where the mouth is at here is more pronounced than the cheekbone. That obviously varies per model and the type of character you're trying to create. So that's another landmark to look for and then just see how far pronounced those teeth are from that cheekbone area. And looking from a lot of different views, uh, really notice that curvature here. It's a really strong curvature. You know, we all know what our teeth essentially look like, but really stop to really understand how extreme that curvature is. And coming up into top view, this is another important view. It really helps me set up the character. Looking for the widest point, you can see that in front view, we can actually see that side plane of the head, which tells me that the widest point on the skull is actually a lot further back. So it's not up here in front by the eyes. It's actually way in the back. Uh, a lot of times it's in alignment with the highest point on the head as well when we're in side view. So here you can really see uh, the shape as the head moves towards the front, or the skull moves towards the front, it really does compress down. And again, just taking a look at this curvature in all directions on that muzzle. So let's go ahead and start talking about some of the muscles in the upper torso. We'll start with the sternocleidomastoid. And you can see here the insertion point of the sternocleidomastoid is right here on the lower part of the skull, so the base of the skull. It starts up there right behind the ear and actually wraps all the way around towards the back of the skull. And if we follow it around front, you can see that it's angled in because the main head of the sternocleidomastoid here attaches to the sternum. So that automatically forces it to be angled in as it wraps down in front view. And you can see the other head here wrapping out and attaching to the clavicle. And if we go back into side view, you can see now that we know the origin and insertion points for this muscle, we can really set up the angle. And obviously, depending on where the head's at, if the head's further forward in space, then this muscle becomes uh, more vertical. And that's a very important thing to understand, and that can also help you get the right position of your head over your torso by looking at the angle of that muscle and uh, making sure it's correct based on your model or what you're after in your character. And you can see I just put a secondary shape in there to represent some of the deeper tissue muscles, a lot of things going on there inside the throat. But I wanted to stay focused on these main muscles in front, the sternocleidomastoid, and then in back, the trapezius, which we're going to talk about next, because those are really the forms that you're seeing when you're sculpting the figure and developing your character. So here you can see, looking at this border, uh, really see up there where the spine of the scapula comes into play and see how this muscle is fanning out from that area. Also should take a second to hide that muscle and show you the seventh cervical vertebrae here. That's an important landmark. I always like to locate that on the model uh, just to under have a better understanding of where all these things are setting up. But that's something you can typically see on the surface. So I wanted to take a second and point that out. And again, noticing the spine of the scapula and how the muscle itself is forming and wrapping up and around and all the way up into the back uh, base of the skull. So from side view, you can really see how this muscle is wrapping over itself and giving it a really interesting contour and wrapping here all the way up in front onto parts of the clavicle. So you can see here in front view, it's actually becoming part of the silhouette. So back to that basic lecture we talked about where one form is coming out of another or becoming the silhouette as it uh, disappears behind another, and this is a good example of that. And let's move on to the pectoralis major. This is a good muscle for illustrating how understanding the origin and insertion points can really help you uh, better define your form. So in front view, you can see this muscle is starting here on the clavicle. It's actually then wrapping around onto the sternum and also has some heads that originate from the rib cage. But you can see how this muscle is fanning out uh, in a lot of different directions here and actually wrapping over itself as it moves towards its insertion point, which is all the way out here on the side of the humerus. So you can see all those points are wrapping down around and kind of fanning out together and wrapping right here on the outside of the humerus. If we move out into side view here, you can see uh, if the arm raises up, now that we know where this muscle inserts, or if it uh, raises up in front view here, 
we know that no matter where that humerus bone goes, that insertion point is not going to change. So we'll always be able to follow that muscle from its origin to its insertion. And for me, that was a, a really good way to just begin the understanding of how these muscles are all going to create these forms. And from this view, you can also see how the pectoralis major really starts to define the front end of what would be the armpit there. So a lot of important things going on with that muscle. And uh, once you understand that origin and insertion, uh, then it can really help you define this entire region. So uh, this whole shoulder region is very difficult. We'll move on to the deltoid now, to the shoulder muscle. And if you look at it from top, you can really see this horseshoe shape. And that's because of where it's originating along that clavicle and uh, wrapping back in, in the back heads here from uh, that spine of the scapula. And all those heads, as you can see, are wrapping and twisting all the way down and around into the front part of the humerus. And one thing you don't want to lose when you're developing this muscle is this curvature here. Uh, one difficult part for me when I was learning anatomy was... Uh, you know, I'd look at these references, and a lot of these shapes in big muscles like this just tend to get flattened out. So what I'd like to do is uh, keep this curvature in here. Really notice how there's a hit there, and then as the muscle masses right here, it tends to have another hit. So I really like to look for those uh, surface changes in the form, and that's really a good way to you know, keep the character and the life in your sculpt. Is when you lose those subtleties, then uh, it can really negatively impact your sculpt. And let's move on to the serratus muscle. You can see it originates here in side view from the upper ribs. And it's visible in most people as that saw-shaped form. Uh, but it actually inserts all the way back here underneath the scapula. So on the underside of the scapula there, and you can see it wrapping out and around those ribs. So it's obviously more pronounced in some people than others. But most of the time you can see it, and then you can see the ribs or parts of the external obliques wrapping out from around those. And we'll talk about those in a second. If we go ahead and make the external obliques visible here, you can see now how you get a little bit of uh, interlacing going on between some of these muscles here in the oblique uh, that are wrapping up and over the rib cage and then kind of tying into that serratus muscle. And as we follow it down the side here, you can really see how it starts to compress against the top of the pelvic bone. So it uh, actually tends to bulge out a bit right here because of that compression. And then you also have this ligament right here between these two points on the pelvis that help uh, kind of define the outer contour of this oblique muscle. But So a lot of uh, angle and direction in this muscle. You can see it wrapping around here from underneath and uh, in between the serratus muscle here, wrapping a little bit up onto the rib cage. But let's go ahead and make the rectus abdominis visible. As you can see, it's uh, starting up there by the pectoralis major and wrapping all the way down towards the pelvis. So obviously this muscle varies greatly depending on the character you're sculpting, uh, but it does uh, help to some degree to understand that there are essentially four main sections and that it's split down the middle by a long linea alba ligament. Also when I'm working in this area I like to use this point on the pelvis to locate the navel. So these points right down here, uh, the crest points we talked about, uh, are typically just below where the navel would be located. But you can look at your specific model and it's always a good landmark or point of reference to go from there see the sternum and clavicle visible. And now let's move back up into this shoulder region and look at this grouping of muscles here. So you can see if we hide the deltoid, these muscles are wrapping around and attaching onto the outside of the humerus. That's the infraspinatus there. And then this one underneath here, the teres major. See how it's wrapping onto the inside. So those are starting to help make the back side of the armpit. But this is also a very difficult grouping of muscles, and I've actually over-exaggerated it here because uh, the muscles themselves can make a lot of a different shape than the actual outline or contour of the muscle. So you can see that bulge shape there on the inside of the form. Uh, that's actually not defined specifically by any edge of the muscle. So again, that varies greatly uh, per person, but it's good to understand that you know this grouping of muscles starts back there on the scapula, 
and inserts and wraps around to those two points on the humerus that we just took a look at. So even from this view, you can really see how you know this this muscles can bulge out in different ways, and depending particularly on uh, if you raise your arm, a lot of different things happen with those muscles and the compression and the way they work. But you can also see now uh, they're actually wrapping underneath that deltoid and then following all the way right into the trapezius on that inner side. All right, I've gone ahead and made the latissimus dorsi visible. And this is another muscle that showcases how understanding the origin and insertion can really help you define the form. You can see if we look at the origin down here around the crest of the pelvis, and it's actually also coming off of the spine, the lower spine here, wrapping all the way underneath the trapezius. So this is a really broad muscle, and all these fibers are wrapping off from those points of origin, again, like the pectoralis major, fanning out and attaching right in here to the inner side of the humerus. Take a look at it from side view. So you see a little bit of curvature there, and you can see how it really extends out past the rib cage. So now here it's becoming the silhouette and helping to form the back side of that armpit area. So it can really help you, uh, depending on your character and how far out that muscle comes, to really understand where it's actually forming the silhouette as opposed to uh, the obliques or the rib cage in the front and then even on the side, as you can see it wrapping up and underneath that muscle. Coming back down here, there are some deeper muscles right here along the spine of the back, but uh, really those just help to push this latissimus out. So, and uh, because this muscle is so broad, you can see here how it wraps over top of the uh, scapula as well. So you can come into front view. Take a look at the overall gesture here that's created and read some of those silhouettes. And see where certain muscle groups are starting and stopping. Look at some of these rhythms that are starting to happen now. From the trapezius into the deltoid, it's wrapping around down towards the upper arm. And what's going on in here with the pectoralis major wrapping into the obliques. And let's look at the mass of the shoulder now that we have all these muscles visible. So the pectoralis major here really wrapping around and underneath that deltoid, essentially becoming one form in the front. Take a look at the back here. The trapezius flows around, but you can see how this can read as one mass, uh, depending on the character again and how well defined they are. That mass that can wrap all the way around from the pectoralis major to the deltoid into that group of uh, teres major and minor muscles and that infraspinatus. All right, so let's go ahead and take more of a global look here. You can see how these muscle forms from the trapezius down in here to the oblique really have a nice curvature to them and help accentuate what we already set up previously in the skeleton. We're looking at that curve of the chest there. And so all these muscles are really flowing off of the skeleton and essentially making those rhythms that we set up earlier uh, even that much more noticeable. If we've done it right, that is. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the arm. And we'll start the arm the same way that we've done the other parts of the body, where uh, we'll go over some of the main points of the skeleton. Take a look at some of these rhythms from the side here. And this is angling back, and then forward, and then back again. So always looking for these rhythms. And when we can find them, uh, if we can, it's almost always better to exaggerate them. Look in here for a little bit of curvature from front view. You can see how that's relating to the curvature in side view. If we take a look up here, this is obviously where the humerus attaches into the scapula. There are some grooves in the bone, that upper part there. That's where the uh, pectoralis major inserts into. Come down to the elbow, those epicondyles of the elbow there, medial and lateral. So just inside and outside, uh, epicondyles are just bumps, really, and have a lot of muscle groups that are going to be attaching uh, onto those two points. We'll go over. You can see how we're getting a little bit of a wrap in the radius there as it's uh, curving down towards the wrist. Take a look at the uh, back view as well, see those epicondyles again, and then this larger part of the ulna as it wraps down to the pinky. Hitting into that wrist again, and always looking for that uh, the curvature and the gesture. Let's see how we can set these things up, even from uh, you know this base level of the skeleton. 
So this really is where everything starts. And taking it all the way down into the hand as well. So we'll be talking about a lot of the muscles of this forearm area, but uh, when we do get down to the hand, I more or less just group those muscles into their major masses because the individual muscles themselves don't define the superficial forms as much. And I wanted to focus more on some of the more difficult areas like uh, around the elbow. So let's go ahead and get started with the biceps brachii here. And this is, again, another one of those muscles that really helps to understand the origins uh, and insertions of. So this really helped me a lot. You know, the shoulder is obviously a difficult area, and this upper arm is part of that. But if we take a look here, the scapula and that odd little shape that comes off there, the coracoid process again. So you can see there are two main heads of the bicep here. And this first medial or inner head attaches all the way up in here onto that coracoid process and the secondary head wraps up around the top of the humerus. So that really helps us set up the overall angle of this muscle which is very important. Um, you know that angle can change depending on the person and character you're setting up but just understanding that origin and insertion again similar to the sternocleidomastoid is really going to help you uh, get that angle right. You notice we've left some space back here. It's because there's another large muscle uh, that we'll talk about in a minute that has to fit in behind this bicep muscle. So looking towards the bottom here at how this inner head wraps under and around and then actually attaches on the outside there to the radius, whereas the outer head here wraps around into this uh, kind of a web aponeurosis and that attaches into a few different muscles. So you can see there attaching into the radius and almost flowing nicely into that bone. And this right here wrapping around again, and that's where the aponeurosis is, and that's what's going to attach right into the flexors here. So we'll take another a closer look at that as well when we get into the flexor muscles. So you can see here how you know, this angle is very drastic, and just understanding that origin and insertion really does set that up for you. All right, go ahead and make the next muscle visible here the brachialis muscle. So it's a deeper muscle, but you also will see it uh, on the surface, and it does affect the surface form as well. You can see here it's wrapping around to the inside from the outside here. So you'll see it. It really lays on the upper arm between the bicep and the tricep, which we'll be pulling up uh, in a few minutes. But looking at how it kind of comes out from behind that bicep and fills that space up right above that medial epicondyle, or that upper bone of the humor, or the upper bump on the humerus, the end of that humerus bone. You can see how it's then wrapping around and attaching onto the ulna. So that muscle as a whole really helps to flex the lower arm. All right, and let's go ahead and make the tricep visible. So the tricep is a very difficult muscle in regards to the form itself. Uh, obviously it has three heads, three main parts to it. Let's go ahead and highlight it so we can get a better look at what's going on here. So this outer or lateral head has an interesting shape. You know, it starts, originates up there on the uh, back and outer side of the humerus. You can see it often comes down here and has uh, a really sharp taper to it as it heads down towards the ulna. You can see right there how that shape itself is often defined and visible uh, in your model. And then this uh, medial head right here, that inner long head wrapping down. So all three of these heads, you can see the other long head right here, or this head uh, wrapping and attaching in onto the scapula. But all three of these heads do actually go down and insert onto that olecranon process or that uh, large bony mass of the ulna. So that's what allows us to extend our lower arm. Again, you can see this back head, uh, a lot of overlapping between these heads. That's again why uh, this becomes a, uh, another difficult form at times to develop. I know it took me a long time to understand and I still uh, go back to reference every time I try to create one. Uh, but here you can see, now this is another great example of looking at the silhouette. And if we look at it even from front view there, let me turn on some other muscles and see how they're all intersecting. But you can see here how the silhouette is visible even in that three-quarter angle. So let's take a look at this deltoid is wrapping around. You can see here you know, there's the edge of the deltoid and then 
coming down into the uh, brachialis, but you can still see that contour that is defined by the tricep. So especially when we go into back view, because it is such a wider muscle than the bicep. Uh, oftentimes from back view, that's all you'll see, depending on how the shoulder itself is rotated. And here you can see that long head of the tricep attaching into the scapula there. So there are a lot of different muscles uh, coming into play here and in interlacing. Uh, so I'll bring a few of those back so we can take a quick look at that. But even down here on the inside, you can see how the tricep is going all the way over and almost meeting up with the bicep. Uh, so that inner area of the arm is also a very difficult area. Let's go ahead and bring this uh, teres major and minor and infraspinatus group back. So, you know, a lot of things going on here, a lot of muscles overlapping, inserting, and uh, starting to play off of each other. So as one overlaps the other, you can see in here, you know, again, how that's going all the way underneath that surface. And that, uh, this long head here, and as it inserts into the scapula, is going to affect this teres uh, major and minor group here, and that infraspinatus on the top. You know, they have to all uh, intersect, and then obviously as one goes under the other, it's going to uh, push that form out. And on the inner side of the arm there, where all those muscles are coming together, a lot of times you get some compression as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, move this part of this muscle over a little bit so we can get a better understanding of what's going on here. As these heads kind of wrap around and again attach onto the back side of the humerus. So that latissimus dorsi actually goes in front of both of those heads of the tricep. It's a little bit hard to see there, but you can see how that actually sometimes pushes off to the side. And depending on how large the latissimus dorsi is, it can push that tricep out. So let's go ahead and zoom out for a second. It's worth taking a look at this muscle from a little bit of a wider angle here. And really looking at this angle overall, and then we'll take a look at some of these hits that are going on within the muscle from the different heads. But you know, a lot of times this, this muscle here actually angles in and sets up a rhythm right there to come out uh, towards the lower arm. So on the outside, kind of wrapping around and going in. And then in side view, a lot of times you get a flow right down into the elbow and into the lower part of the arm. Here you can see where it's actually visible, like again, creating that silhouette, you know, really understanding where these muscles are, that brachialis again, depending on how far you rotate this shoulder, uh, you might be seeing a different muscle. So just understanding where they're at in space and then, again, really trying to uh, read that silhouette, uh, you know, it's something that it really helped me clarify how these forms actually interrelate and, and uh, are truly developed in space and where they actually fit into the, the figure. Again, looking at this rhythm here and seeing how it's starting to flow, hopefully, down into uh, the radius there. So a lot of different views here. You know, this is a very difficult area, the inner part of the arm there, but I wanted to show that again. Just take a look on that tricep. And a lot of times you'll get a little definition in here where you can see uh, the separation of those two heads. And, you know, there are a lot of other fatty tissues and things going on in there as well. But um, it's just a good... A global starting point just to understand you know how all those muscles are relating to one another and the overall angle that they're creating all right so now let's get into a really difficult area on the arm and uh, take a look at this muscle first this is the brachioradialis so a really difficult muscle but if you can uh, understand again this origin and insertion right here along the upper part outer edge of the humerus uh, you know, starting from there and seeing how it's wrapping down and around. So it's actually going over uh, what would be the joint of the elbow where the end of the humerus is there. Wrapping down and around here and then inserting all the way on the inner part of the radius. You can see here from side view and uh, from front view a lot of curvature in this muscle. But I always uh, try to start by defining this muscle whenever I'm creating uh, a middle arm or the forearm area because this one really sets up a lot of things. Uh, typically, you know, when I was first starting out in particular, uh, my upper arm and lower arm would look very disjointed and it was almost always because I didn't have this muscle in the right place. I'll just go ahead and make this uh, visible here. The pronator teres. Uh, this for me is an important muscle just because it helps to set up the overlap here and uh, interchange between those exterior 
the flexors and extensors, but we'll come back to that in a second. So now I've gone ahead and made this flexor group visible. You see right here, we're looking at the extensor carpi radialis longus. So this is another one of those muscles that bridges the lower and upper arm. So another very important muscle. And in the top here, it actually appears to blend into the uh, brachioradialis. A lot of times you can't really differentiate between those two, at least on this uh, more front side. But, you know, again, looking at that mass, I typically group that together and then uh, look for this line right here. A lot of times that's very visible on people where that muscle actually ends and then you have these other flexor groups that insert onto that uh, lateral epicondyle in there, one of those bumps that we talked about on the humerus, uh, how those flexor muscles uh, originate all the way underneath there and actually uh, go all the way down the arm. So I have chosen to group those into you know, just one major mass there. There are a lot of different heads on that muscle mass that go down and split out to each individual finger, but all of them essentially do the same thing. They just flex your fingers forward and visually uh, you know, even if you look at a cadaver, there are essentially one main mass as a form there. So we just went ahead and made another muscle group visible in dark gray there, the extensor pollicis brevis and longus. And that's a really important muscle mass, uh, for me at least, because it helps me set up this rhythm. If I look from that brachioradialis coming down, it hits right there, and then those muscles come out uh, from underneath it, attaching onto the radius there and start to make that hit point as opposed to the back that's pretty straight. So hit right there as it wraps around and underneath that brachioradialis. Let's go ahead and move on to the flexor group. You can see they're originating from that medial epicondyle, that bump on the humerus and flowing. Again, I've uh, grouped these into a mass because essentially they are one solid form, but there are a lot of different muscles in there that go out and fan out to the individual fingers to flex those fingers down looking at that form from a lot of different angles you can see you get a nice curvature to it there and uh, it's a pretty difficult area to understand with all these different muscles coming into but for me really understanding that a lot of them originated on those two epicondyles really helped me start to understand how those forms are going to flow out from there here you can see how we talked about that aponeurosis before on the bicep uh, flowing out and essentially feathering into or attaching into this grouping of flexor muscles. And looking from this view, you can really see how that muscle mass right there almost starts to flow right up into what is the muscle mass of the tricep right here. Make almost more of a straight line on the inside there, right there on that as the contour. So again, reading that contour and trying to understand what major muscle groups uh, create that actual shape. And went ahead and threw this in here, the extensor retinaculum. So if we look at uh, these extensor muscles, we talked about that grouping of them coming down here. And as they fan out into their individual tendons, all those tendons wrap underneath that retinaculum. And that really just helps hold them in place. You can see here all those tendons fanning out. I didn't get uh, too in-depth with the tendons. You know, they're really fairly straightforward. Uh, more or less straight lines that kind of fan out as they expand from that retinaculum down towards the individual fingers. Looking here again at these muscles, and they also go under that retinaculum, and then those are the two that uh, two main tendons that wrap off towards the thumb. So those are important landmarks as well, and you can uh, probably see those in your own hand. So kind of important to point out. And let's go ahead and just take a step back for a minute. Now that we have all these muscle groups and uh, tendons visible, we can really take a look at all these forms together. Look at the arm here and really see how those angles are playing off one another. And you know, look at the upper arm and how it relates to the lower arm and the different global angles that are created. You know, again, now that we know that uh, where this bicep is inserting up here, way underneath that deltoid and pectoralis, it hopefully helps us understand why that angle is happening. Take a look at this deltoid here and, uh, you know, remembering about those different hits on these muscle groups so that they don't just become uh, one solid curve or arc. You know, a lot of times those arcs change and that's really what helps set up these rhythms and the way those arcs relate to one another, you know, uh, really help the, the overall gesture of our character. 
looking at how on the inside here it's a lot uh, more of a fluid straighter line that's created by these masses as opposed to that outer edge there uh, where it really does hit you have a so you have that nice long lean line on the inside and then the hit from this brachioradialis muscle uh, that's created there so again a nice juxtaposition and that happens a lot on the figure where you have a long clean line on one side and then on the other you'll have uh, kind of a complementary hit or a curved line to it been looking uh, inside view and see how all these forms are just starting to wrap around so you know nothing is really straight a lot of times that happens it uh, happens to my work all the time I have to go back to it and uh, try to find these curves again or the flow and really understand how one mass is flowing into the other and why again here had this hit the brachialis brachioradialis wrapping down and then the nice clean line on the back side and again, one last thing that's uh, worth pointing out again is how these groupings of muscles overlap one another to define the silhouette. You know, this is obviously a great area to understand that, and as the tricep wraps down and around, uh, you know, it's a great exercise to look at these muscles or take your reference, whether it's 2D or 3D, and really start to understand, you know, where one muscle overlaps in front of the other right here where the tricep stopping and then this brachioradialis is coming out you know that tells you a lot about how the actual form is developing and looking at here on this inner side again how that line is nice and smooth and uh, that contour of the silhouette is fairly straightforward as opposed to that outside uh, with more of a hit Let's go ahead and take a look, uh, just a quick look at the hand here. I just threw these muscle masses in here. You know, they're fairly straightforward as to where they originate and insert. Uh, but I just wanted to show you that. And then there's that little bit of the flexor retinaculum visible here. You can see these tendons from that flexor group going out and flowing underneath that retinaculum all the way out uh, down towards the fingertips. So one last look at the wrist area there. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the legs. So let's go ahead and start talking about some of the rhythms and the gestures that are created by these bones. So the upper leg bone, the femur, and then uh, down towards the bottom here, the larger bone on the inside, you have the tibia. And of course, the smaller bone is the fibula. You can see how there's some nice curvature already going on in those bones. Uh, come up here and just talk about one more landmark uh, this greater trochanter here that's something you can typically see on the surface of your character so it's an important uh, thing to take note of if we zoom out here a little bit more come into side view you can see you get a nice arc uh, in that upper femur and then as it wraps around it curves back out towards the foot and you get down into the tibia the tibia really uh, almost always does have a little bit of a sweep to it at the very lower end of it and wrapping all the way out uh, into the foot so it really helps the line flow out towards the foot there take a look at the tibia and fibula at the end there those are obviously the bones that create your ankle and uh, for me another helpful landmark is knowing that this outer bone here the tibia is lower than the fibula so the ankle itself uh, you know it's not even we take a look at this angle uh, because the foot is so far out I'm just going to move it in here and now you can really see how the femur is angled. So there's a really drastic angle to that bone when the leg is fairly straight. And we'll talk about how that sets up a nice platform for some of the adductor muscles to attach to. So notice here you know, that that angle definitely changes from the upper leg to the lower leg. Also take a look at this angle here. You know, a nice arcing angle from the top of the leg all the way down to the ankle. But I'll go ahead and move our stance back out. And look at that angle. So we hopefully haven't lost that angle, uh, that backward angle and arc of the leg, uh, you know, no matter what stance we're in. Hopefully we can maintain that. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to some of the musculature here. So we'll start at the top with the gluteus maximus muscle. Just make some of these other forms visible, some of the forms we've already covered just so we can see how they're all uh, 
playing off one another and where one stops and one starts but you can see all those muscles uh, you know, have the spine or the crest of the pelvis in common so you can see how the that arc is very important you know that arc of the pelvis is what sets up the platform for this gluteus maximus to wrap around and originate from but this is a very difficult muscle because it covers uh, a larger area but again it's not one of those muscles that just uh, creates a straight line from one area to the other so a few things that uh, can help understand how this form actually develops you can see how these striations and musculature are actually wrapping out almost make a C more of a C shape from the side as they go back uh, all towards that greater trochanter and you can see that head of the tensor fascia latte there uh, we just fix some of these muscles and fill out that form a little bit more but a lot of different things going on in this area you know as those muscles are wrapping around uh, inserting into a lot of different things so you can kind of see how it, for me it really helped just to essentially understand that more or less this makes a C shape and there's a lot of fullness there you can see this arc right here that's really a surface change so a hit in the surface as it's flowing out really does a drastic change in direction and then hits that curvature but all essentially flows uh, in towards that C. And let me just uh, hide that for a second. We can take a look at that landmark there. So again, that's a landmark that's typically visible uh, on your character, at the, the end of the crest of the pelvis. You can see that ligament again wrapping down around to that bottom part of the pelvis. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the adductor muscles. Just made this a grouping of muscles, and uh, it's visible more on the inside of the leg than anywhere else, but a little bit of it is visible uh, on that top part as well. You can see here originating from the underside of that pelvis, and this is where that arc uh, or the angle of the femur comes into play. So you can see as that femur is angled down, that's allowing these muscles to kind of make this triangular shape as they come down and attach and kind of fan out from the pelvis and attach all the way down along the length of that femur. Get a good view from the back here just to see as well how it's fanning out and kind of flowing down. So because of that angle of the femur, it's allowing us to get this more triangular shape. But essentially, only the top part of the top triangle of that muscle mass is going to be visible. You can see I just made the quads visible. Let's go ahead and make the sartorius muscle visible, and we'll come back and talk about that a lot more as well. But now you can really start to see how these masses are relating and overlapping. If we take a look at the quadricep here. It's another very uh, complex form, but some of the things that help are understanding the overall angle that it takes. So it really does um, angle inboard. You can see here that larger inner head is uh, on the inside of the knee there, much larger mass. And that's why the weight of this form in general uh, appears to be flowing uh, at that angle. So kind of flowing in from the outside here towards the inside of the knee. You can see where it's also attaching or up here originating uh, on that crest, that end bone on the pelvic crest. And all these muscles are kind of flowing around. So just four different heads of this muscle, similar to the tricep where you have uh, superficial and deeper heads. But I really like to just think of this as an overall shape, kind of that teardrop shape. Let's go ahead and make that sartorius muscle visible again so you can see how that basically cradles this shape and differentiates the quadricep from those adductor muscles. You can see how it, uh, this is a very important muscle, that S shape that it creates as it's attaching uh, make it visible so you can see it here again starting from that same point on the pelvis and wrapping all the way down and around and then inserting down there onto the tibula. So that's a nice landmark to find if you can find it on your model because that really helps differentiate a, a lot of different muscle masses. And let's go ahead and take one more look at the quadriceps so we can talk about the insertion points. On the outside here there's a typically a, a larger fascia that can be found and then sometimes you can see where it branches off and uh, look at this bulge area as it wraps around and kind of attaches onto that inner head of the quadricep there. A lot of times in some people this is more visible than others but you get that bulge of the compression 
between that fascia and the kneecap. So again, this head right here, more of a teardrop shape, this inner edge and wrapping around and a lot of ligaments and other tendons going on in the kneecap area is all these forms, all these muscles here uh, that we're grouping into the quadricep group here, and wrap down and essentially attach onto the front side of the tibia. So there are a lot of different ligaments and tendons that are wrapping around and creating the surfaces that you're going to see on the surface of the knee. And I went ahead and made a grouping of ligaments just to make it a little bit easier for you to understand how those are actually affecting the form. So you can see as they're just wrapping around and essentially covering that bone. So you're seeing the main form of the bone, the quadricep, and the patella, which is the kneecap. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the hamstrings now, the muscles of the rear upper part of the leg. So there are actually a lot of different muscles that are creating these masses. Uh, but the main thing to remember here is, uh, again, their origin and insertion. If we look at how this is flowing out and down, they're actually inserting on either side of the knee here. So onto the bone, they're wrapping out and around and attaching onto the two lower bones of the leg see here the outer edge and notice again what's visible in the silhouette so the hamstring is only visible at the very bottom on the outside uh, but again uh, you know because of most of that quadricep and the adductor muscles on the inside here are what are creating the form you know depending on how we rotate around the figure and typically from the rear view we can see the upper part of the quadricep here and that's because the quadricep is usually out further than the hamstring Move into side view and look at these rhythms and see where those heads of the hamstring are separating and wrapping around towards the bones of the lower leg, kind of giving a little bit of a hit out at the bottom there. See from a few different views uh, how those ligaments are wrapping around and the tendons kind of flowing uh, in towards the sides of the two lower leg bones, the tibia and the fibula there. And if we move up towards the top of this uh, muscle grouping, you can see how all those heads of the hamstring are wrapping up underneath the gluteus maximus and inserting onto the lower part of the pelvis. So let's go ahead and move on to the lower leg. The rear part will start with the gastronemius group, so essentially the calf muscles. You have two main heads there. Uh, but before we uh, move into those, I want to show you how the insertion happens uh, in between those two heads of the hamstring. So you can see here how both of these heads of this calf muscle are kind of wrapping up over the knee joint and inserting onto the back side of the upper leg bone here. So they're typically not as full as, full as I've made them right here, uh, but I wanted to keep them there just to show you an important rhythm that's happening. So you can see how they're flowing up and inserting in between there, but even from side view right here, you'll notice that hit. So the hit that's created from those muscles wrapping up and around is fairly important because that sets up the transition from the upper leg to the lower leg, at least in rear view. So just adjust that shape a little bit. So typically those heads, uh, they do fan out a little bit more and separate from each other. But again, I wanted to keep that fullness in there just to illustrate the point. And we'll talk more about that uh, when we've gone over all the muscle groups. Then we'll take a second to go back and just look at all these global rhythms again. And we'll talk more about this transition as well. All right, so let's move down and look at these different heads and hit points. So you'll notice this head ends lower than the inner head here. It's a nice little angle created from that. And if we come into front view, you can see there's another angle on the knee, and then this angle plays off of it in rear view. So these heads are essentially split down the middle, and they all kind of converge and go into form the Achilles tendon, wrapping all the way down and attaching to the heel. You can see this outer curvature here. It's a lot subtler on the outside than you'll see on the inside here, because that muscle, this inner head, really does wrap around. So flat and smoother on the outside, and then again more of a hit right here on the inside. And if we take another look at this inner head as it wraps around to the front, you can really see how it fans out and uh, has more of a, a sharper edge even in the front line as it heads towards the tibia. So there you can see part of the tibia, the shin bone is actually visible. 
And then there's a, a deeper muscle right there that kind of fills in that space between uh, what becomes the Achilles heel and the back of the tibia there. And let's go ahead and look at some of these front lower leg muscles. So the tibialis anterior is the main one here, wrapping uh, kind of from the front area of the lower knee, wrapping all the way down and uh, onto the foot. So you can see how it kind of parallels the tibia here, the shin bone, but you also get this nice arc from side view. So that's really what lets you get this hit from the kneecap. There's a hit right there from this muscle as it curves down, and then you get a secondary hit right there, uh, typically in the middle of the shin from side view right here. And then that uh, transitions into the flow or the line that flows out towards the foot. So it wraps around. You also see the uh, baronius longus there. It wraps around. You can see it from uh, this three-quarter rear view as well. And you can see here, if we follow that uh, tibialis anterior up, there's almost a line that goes right up onto the upper leg. So a nice curved line on the inside, and then a little bit of a straighter line right here as that form flows down from the knee into that lower leg and then starts to arc out. And let's go ahead and uh, make this retinaculum and the tendons visible. So we take a quick look at those. Obviously the tendons on the top of the foot are typically something you will see uh, when you're sculpting your figure or creating a character. Uh, the retinaculum is just there again to hold everything in place. But you can see here I've just, uh, similar to the hand where I've uh, put these muscle masses in because really it's that global shape of the foot that we're after, and that curvature. Uh, but I did want to put the tendons in there because you can see them. Let me take a look here. You know, these muscles wrapping down around on the bottom of the foot, uh, allowing us to maintain that arch on the inside. So the arch on the inside and then the flatter, smoother transition on the outside. So you can see here these extensors wrapping all the way down around under that retinaculum and flowing out right into those tendons. You can see the split here, it's actually going to allow you to see the uh, outer part of the fibula, which is going to make that outer ankle bone. And you can see how those retinaculums are attaching to the inner ankle bone there. And let's take a second just to zoom out here and talk about uh, some of the rhythms, the similarities in the rhythms of the leg and the arm. So we see again here long sweeping line on the outside, a nice transition into the lower leg, and then more of a hit on the inside and definite surface change. A number of different surface changes actually bring the arm uh, visible again. And we'll take a look at this lower part of the arm here again, that hit, and then the longer, straighter sweep on the outside. So, or the back. So, very similar, you know, and a lot of these rhythms they flow throughout all the different forms of the body and uh, they can really help tie everything together. So, however, you develop those rhythms, you know, depending on. Uh, the type of character you're creating, they should all speak to one another, or at least I think it certainly helps when they do. Let's go ahead and focus here on the uh, upper part of the leg and just some of these global rhythms again. So now that we have everything done, you can take a look here at those adductors and then this long flowing line on the outside and overall really notice uh, because of that quadricep now you see that angle to it. It's really uh, making it appear that this upper leg area is really angling in uh, towards the inside of the knee, shifting that weight towards the inside of the knee. So it's flowing from there, wrapping around and hitting, and then uh, the weight is actually shifting to the outside of the lower leg. You take a look from rear view, so the weight on the outside shifting into the knee and then back out to that outer calf muscle. A nice little twist on the ankle area as well. In uh, weight in the front here, we hide uh, some of those arm muscle groups. Take a look here, the weight in the front, and then again we talked about that transition from the knee, uh, or as the knee actually transitions the upper part of the leg into the lower part of the leg, it really does change its angle. So the upper part of the leg's one angle here, and then a hit right there, and then the weight shifts to the back of the leg through that calf muscle. And again, these shifts in weight typically complement one another from one view to the next. So in front view here you can see 
and you have a lot of, of weight change where the mass of the muscle on the lower leg is flowing now onto the outside. So it's on the inside of the knee area and then it flows to the outside. And here you can see these other masses flow and complement as well. Let's go ahead and make everything visible. So we can take one last look at our completed figure. And that about wraps up part one in the form of anatomy series, Muscles of the Body. I hope you've enjoyed it, and if you'd like to follow along with this lecture using the ZTL tool, it's available for purchase at zachpetrock.com.